Thank you, Trevor. We look forward to seeing you and speaking with you over the next few days. We are now honored to introduce our Dr. Mark Weinberg lecturer for 2019. Dr. Mark Tyndall is a professor at the University of British Columbia. His doctoral degree in epidemiology from Harvard University focused on health and human rights. He has conducted research internationally in a number of countries, particularly in Kenya. In Canada, he has provided leadership in Ottawa, Vancouver, and British Columbia more broadly. His career awards are many. He is an author on over 250 peer-reviewed publications and has won awards for his teaching and mentorship. In 2017, he presented a TED Talk on harm reduction that has generated over 1.2 million views. Dr. Tyndall has conducted numerous community-based research projects, including epidemiological studies on HIV and hepatitis C, ART access among people who inject drugs, healthcare utilization among marginalized populations, and harm reduction. Most recently, his focus has been on the devastating overdose epidemic in Canada, where criminalization of people who use drugs, poverty, trauma, and the failed policies of drug prohibition have set the stage for a public health crisis. Please uh, welcome Dr. Mark Tyndall to the stage. Thank you. Did you get a picture? Okay, picture. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I have we, as we've been sitting here for about an hour, I would suggest that everybody take one moment and just stand up and stretch your legs. Um, I'm a public health doctor. I'm trying to keep people as healthy as possible. Okay, that's enough. Sit down, please. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I am a white settler on stolen land. I am aware that this acknowledgement is meaningless unless I am committed to actively walking the path of truth and reconciliation, and I'm doing my best to do that. It is a real honor to present the 2019 Mark Weinberg Lecture. I have attended many Mark Weinberg Lectures, and some of my closest colleagues and mentors have had this responsibility. The big difference this year is that Mark is no longer sitting in the front row. It is also the first time that Mark hasn't been able to make some self-deprecating remarks about his own mortality and how someday this will be a memorial lecture. I had the opportunity to get to, Mar get to know Mark and count him as a friend. If given the chance, I'm sure he would have made some mention of how he destroyed me in a debate around treatment as prevention at the CAR conference in Montreal in 2008. That wouldn't be true. <laughs> we will all miss Mark's intelligence, enthusiasm, and passion, and recognize that the Canadian and global HIV family have suffered a tremendous loss with his passing. I hope that my remarks today would be in keeping with what Mark would have championed himself. And I know that I have been influenced in my own advocacy work by his unwavering commitment to social justice and speaking out for those without a voice. I've had a while to consider what I wanted to say today, as I know this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. What became clear to me as I considered this is how long I've actually been doing this work in HIV. My career and in some ways my life has been driven by this one disease. I started medical school in 1982, which was about the same time that the first cases of AIDS were being described. And while I have seen incredible scientific advances in diagnostics, treatment and prevention over these years, changing the social and structural forces that propel the epidemic 
has been less incredible. On, on some issues, we have made little or no progress. Year after year at the CAR conference, we hear about many of the same challenges, the same risk factors, the same vulnerable populations, and too often the same outcomes. I think it is time to do things differently, to learn from people like Mark Weinberg, to change some rules, to speak out about things that have strangled some of our best prevention efforts, to spend more time rolling out interventions and innovations, and less time trying to come up with the perfect research question, to honor the people who have truly suffered from this epidemic by directly involving them in solutions ultimately to become stronger advocates and be willing to break some glass. For this year's lecture, I tried to come up with a provocative title, Does HIV Cause AIDS? Now, for those of you who know Mark Weinberg, a title like that would have caused him to go apoplectic. <laughs> Mark is internationally known for his stand in South Africa, where he went on an absolute Care to eviscerate then President Mbeki and a group of HIV deniers who were challenging the connection between HIV immunodeficiency and the effectiveness of antiretroviral treatment. Wherever you are, Mark, my intention is not to question the biology of HIV or the effectiveness of antiretroviral treatment. I am 100% convinced that HIV is the pathogen that directly causes immunodeficiency and that the drugs designed to stop viral replication work amazingly well. However, with the tremendous improvements in our treatment and the availability of treatment globally, no one actually has to get AIDS. No one has to die because their CD4 cells have been wiped out by a virus. Yet, this is still happening. Further, no one actually has to get HIV. With what we know about transmission and the available prevention tools that we have, there is no reason that viral transmission has to occur. Yet, this is still happening. It is now widely acknowledged that HIV is a disease of inequality, discrimination, and neglect. This acknowledgement has spawned a whole range of responses focusing on what are commonly called high-risk groups or vulnerable populations or key affected populations. In fact, many of us have chosen areas of interest and research that focus on a particular group of people. And while we have danced around with the least offensive terminology, we can never escape the fact that when we associate HIV infection with a particular group of people based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, occupation, or a chosen behavior, we risk alienating, victimizing, and stigmatizing the entire group. Remember the four H's that were widely used to describe the epidemic in the early 1980s homosexuals, hemophiliacs, Haitians, and heroin users. What terrible damage that did through blame, fear, and discrimination. In some ways, we have never recovered. The heroic struggles to push back on a system that is best slow to respond and at worst discriminatory and negligent is what I would like to talk about today. I think there are some valuable lessons to be learned if we look where things have moved forward and where things have stalled or even regressed, where we have been able to change the laws and structures that impede our work and where we haven't, and where we have seen people step forward as champions and where nobody has. Mostly, I hope to challenge us all to be meaningfully engaged as change makers. We need to commit to creating real change. It is simply not acceptable to document the challenges without pushing back. I would like to go through some of the hard-fought victories that have happened in HIV and the central role of advocacy and activism. It should be stated up front that some of the strongest voices in these movements have come from Canada. These include policymakers, medical leaders, and researchers, but most of the credit goes to members of the communities themselves who have risked everything to create change. As you will see, all these struggles have one thing in common. Change came through people who were unwilling to back down despite the barriers. In fact, the actual evidence to support these ideas often came later, 
The interventions were based on doing the right thing versus acting on available scientific evidence. Let's start with the pivotal work of Mark Weinberg, who led a response to HIV in Africa. At the time, the world was faced with a rather stark question. Should people in Africa who are unable to access antiretroviral therapy simply be allowed to die? This is quite a profound question. And there was a time when most people, at least by their silence, said yes. Basically, it was argued that it was too complicated and expensive to treat poor people in faraway places. And the multinational pharmaceutical companies who controlled the drugs saw little opportunity for profit and held on tightly to their patents. Oh, slip that one in so you get your CME credits. <laughs> in the midst of this debate around whether or not to provide antiretro drugs to Africa, there emerged a rather bizarre twist. Claims that HIV did not cause AIDS. This was the last straw for Mark Weinberg, who led a charge to call this out. This is classic Mark Weinberg look of exasperation. You can fill in the caption. You could start with, what the? And I, I hesitated, but I, I won't continue with that uh, line, but you can fill in your own caption. The tribute to Mark Weinberg that occurred in The Lancet really described this quite well. Mark planned the 2000 Durban HIV conference specifically because the South African president was refusing to accept that AIDS was caused by HIV, says David Edelman, vice principal for health affairs and dean of the faculty of medicine at McGill. This speaking truth to power was very much part of his personality. He was not afraid to open his mouth and say what had to be said and with enormous effectiveness. This type of leadership opened the door to community-led organizations and gave credibility to a groundswell of protests and activism to demand treatment globally. One of the most important lessons from this rollout of antiretrovirals in Africa was that it was not evidence-based at all. No one really knew if you could successfully supply drugs to poor urban and rural areas in Africa. No one knew you could treat HIV without doctors. No one knew if people would take the drugs consistently. No one knew whether the supply chain could be maintained. No one knew where sustainable funding would come from. And no one could be sure that massive drug resistance wouldn't develop. The provision of life-saving medications was just the right thing to do. And any un unintended consequences would be dealt with down the road. The move to antiretroviral treatment scale-up could not be stopped just because of all the unknowns. The rest is history, although the fight to supply people with antiretroviral drugs is far from over. In January 1990, years before effective HIV treatment was available anywhere, I moved to Nairobi, Kenya to work on the University of Manitoba project as part of my Infectious Diseases Fellowship. It is interesting to note that Frank Plummer, Stephen Moses, Ken Rosenthal, and Bill Cameron also worked in Nairobi and have presented the Mark Weinberg Lecture. Working in East Africa during the 1980s and 1990s was life-changing for us all. HIV was spreading like crazy, and there was basically nothing to stop it. The mighty condom was basically the only thing separating people from infection, and it was proving to be entirely inadequate. During the 1990s, literally millions of people in East and Southern Africa were acquiring HIV. Most had no idea they were being infected, and there was generally very little attention paid to the epidemic. Obviously, the impacts on families and communities was devastating but most people suffered in silence. The governments at the time hardly mentioned HIV, while people were dying all over the place. This is a picture taken outside the special treatment clinic on River Road in Nairobi in 1990. That was my project car. I was living the expat life. The lineup for the clinic generally started around dawn, and between 500 and 800 people filed through the clinic every day. That isn't counting the hundreds of people who were routinely turned away. People were referred 
to this particular clinic from all over the country if they had any complaint between their waist and their thighs. My research project focused on genital ulcer disease. At that time, men presenting to this clinic with a genital ulcer had a 50% chance of being HIV positive. They would all later die of AIDS. We are still living with the dark ages of rampant HIV transmission in the region as a massive disproportionate burden of HIV exists in southern and eastern Africa. And despite the notable achievements of bringing HIV medications to Africa, it took far too long. In North America, the number of deaths due to AIDS peaked in 1995, which is the same year that clinical trials for HIV treatment showed excellent results. In Africa, meanwhile, AIDS-related deaths only began to decline in 2007. That is over a decade later. Millions of people in Africa died without access to treatment when effective treatment existed. While the scale-up of antiretroviral drugs in Africa will be remembered as a great global achievement, at the same time, history will show that the delay in scale-up was one of the biggest failures. Only after years of protest and advocacy was antiretroviral therapy scaled up. A critical turning point came from the PEPFAR initiative, led by President George Bush, who committed $15 billion between 2004 and 2008 to provide HIV treatment and care. The Global Fund has continued to support the cost of antiretroviral treatment, and without these programs, it is hard to know what the global HIV epidemic would look like. But there is still a long way to go. While aspirational targets like 90-90-90 and the end of AIDS by 2030 are necessary and important international goals, in 2017 it was estimated that only 60% of people living with HIV were on antiretroviral treatment. This large treatment deficit is driven mainly by coverage of, in low-income countries, especially Africa. Despite this unfinished business, in Canada, we rarely talk about our obligations to support the global campaign on AIDS. In North America, AIDS emerged as a disease affecting gay men. The evolution of gay rights during my lifetime has been quite extraordinary and has been closely intertwined with activism around AIDS. In the history of public health, there has probably never been a stronger call to action than shown through the advocacy and sacrifice of men living with HIV in the 1980s. ACT UP really defines what activism can do, and the silence equals death graphic is profound in its simplicity. One of the best records of the early days of the HIV activism can be found in Randy Schultz's 1987 book, And the Band Played On that chronicles the activism in San Francisco. A quote from the book is, most importantly, the epidemic was only news when it was not killing homosexuals. In this sense, AIDS remained a fundamentally gay disease, newsworthy only by virtue of the fact that it sometimes hit people who weren't gay. This book had a profound impact on how I viewed HIV and how activism was critical for change. Society did not act largely because they really didn't care about gay men dying. The movie How to Survive a Plague also had a profound impact on my understanding of activism as it chronicled the impact of a social movement. The whole trajectory of HIV was changed by the relentless activism of ACT UP. David France, the director of the movie, later published a book by the same title in 2016. I'd like to read a brief excerpt from that book. I had arrived in New York City for the first time for a college internship at the United Nations and a chance to explore Christopher Street, the mountain, mountain top of gay life. I was not yet comfortable there, but Manhattan struck me as a city of promise at once grimy and magical, where people could hide and be found. My college roommate Brian, an artist, and I took up in a tiny one-room apartment in Midtown, sleeping chastely on opposite sides of a narrow, lumpy bed. Our timing was unfortunate. 
Just two weeks after unpacking, on the Friday, the 4th of July weekend, the New York Times carried the first news of the plague. Quote, rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals, ran the headline. The cases were concentrated in Manhattan, with a few in the San Francisco Bay Area as well, and consisted of violet-colored spots appearing somewhere on the body, easily mistaken for bruises, though they were sometimes raised and textured. One in five of the affected were already dead. The article noted that, quote, most cases had involved homosexual men who had multiple and frequent sexual encounters with different partners, as many as 10 sexual encounters each night, up to four times a week. Many of the patients have also been treated for viral infections such as herpes, cytomegalovirus, and hepatitis B, as well as parasitic infections such as uh, amoebiasis and giardiasis. Many patients also reported that they had used drugs such as amyl nitrate and LSD to heighten sexual pleasure. That's from David France. To me, looking back, it is quite incredible to read this piece in the New York Times. What stigmatizing and sensational reporting. The article described the people dying from this mystery disease as less than human. Aberrant sexual behaviors, vectors of all kinds of unpronounceable infections, and pleasure-seeking drug use. This was on top of the extreme prejudice that already existed toward gay men. The underlying message was that they were deserving of this. It is a narrative that has been very difficult to reverse and is unfortunately still around. People who get HIV are somehow deserving. Victim blaming still happens in our conversations, in the media, and by our political leaders. It almost always goes unchallenged. I had the opportunity to attend the International AIDS Conference in San Francisco in 1990. I was able to watch the activism firsthand, marches in the street, tearing down pharma booths, screaming at politicians. It was the best AIDS conference ever. I actually attended this conference with an entourage of colleagues from Kenya. Watching the dykes on bikes riding motorcycles during a conference demonstration was an unforgettable experience. It was all new to me, but my Kenyan friends, many of whom had never traveled outside the country, basically had their minds blown. <laughs> it is clear that without the ACT UP movement, effective treatment would have been delayed by years, maybe many years. Again, the treatment availability was not based on a lot of existing evidence. People were dying and demanding to receive treatment. They were willing to take chances. They didn't have time for the FDA approval machinery to give them the go-ahead. They weren't going to wait for randomized clinical trials to be published in medical journals. They could not wait to see if these drugs had long-term side effects. Under such dire circumstances, people were demanding action. And ACT UP was the driver of this action. As we've heard, front and center at this conference is the inadequate response to HIV among Indigenous peoples. This is especially stark right here in Saskatchewan, although it was great to hear all the progress that's being made. I remember speaking at the 2010 CAR conference right here in Saskatoon. The number of new infections was already quite high at that time. I was speaking at a plenary session right after listening to a provincial politician who had just announced one-time funding of $250,000 for the provincial AIDS response. Even then, $250,000 was a ridiculously small amount of money, and I told him that during my talk. It was clear to me and everyone else in the audience that HIV among First Nations in Saskatchewan was not a provincial priority. Since that time, the HIV epidemic in Saskatchewan has marched on. The impact among First Nations communities is clearly disproportionate and unacceptable. These infographics from pub the Public Health Agency of Canada, Canada illustrate the extent of the problem, with rates far exceeding the national average. <clears throat> 
and 70% of the provincial HIV infections occurring among indigenous peoples. It must be stated that this is not just a problem for Saskatchewan. There is not a province in Canada where First Nations people are not overrepresented in the HIV statistics. The health of Indigenous people across Canada is in crisis, and, in, and HIV is just part of this. This is one area where HIV researchers and the medical community have not been very effective. There has simply not been enough organized advocacy to draw attention to this problem or sufficient input into what to do. With some exceptions that we heard about earlier this evening, we have not been able to step out of our rigid approaches to HIV care, treatment and prevention. Instead of being open to new ways of engagement that acknowledge the unique needs of Indigenous people, we have only managed to make minor accommodation in the way we approach HIV. We have clung to paternalistic medical models that have not been working. We have been very reluctant to go beyond standard evidence-based programs and have not listened to the affected communities. There are many examples of this. Ironically, for the most part, we tend to blame the communities themselves for not listening to our bad advice. It is time to provide the necessary resources and follow the lead of these Indigenous communities. Closely associated with the HIV epidemic among Indigenous peoples is the national tragedy of murdered and missing women. While this has occurred across Canada, a lot of the attention has been focused on British Columbia. I was actually working in the downtown east side of Vancouver during the years when over 50 women were murdered. How did this ever happen? And after the conviction of Robert Picton, why haven't we taken steps to protect women and change the way we approach sex work? The perils of women, women working in the sex trade have not substantially changed since the Picton trial. That was in 2007, 12 years ago. This is not to say that Canadians are not aware of the crisis. There have been a groundswell of activism and attention given to the issue. But to this point, there has been little movement on the laws and policies that are required to provide safety and improve lives, especially for young Aboriginal women. The structures, policies, and laws that society has put in place directly perpetuate the problem and must be changed. The activism necessary to force these changes is far from over. Eight, yeah, give me a break. <laughs> Thank you. HIV transmission among people who use drugs has been a tragic and largely avoidable crisis in Canada. It was known very early in the HIV epidemic that the infection was spreading easily and quickly among people injecting drugs. During the mid-1990s, it was estimated that one in three active drug users in Vancouver were HIV positive. If not for unsanctioned needle and syringe distribution, this would have been even higher. People who injected drugs in other Canadian cities, cities also experienced high HIV rates, but the density of drug users living in the downtown east side and the intensity of the drug use set up this community for an unprecedented HIV outbreak. As would be expected, not only were HIV rates exceptionally high, so were hepatitis C rates, overdoses, injection-related infections, and overwhelming community-based suffering and despair. This is an iconic picture of Dean Wilson sitting in front of crosses in Oppenheimer Park during the last overdose crisis in 1996. Over the years, the downtown east side has hosted a range of natural and scientific experiments. It has been the site of innovative supported housing projects, low barrier medical clinics, needle and syringe distribution projects, the emergence of drug user advocacy groups like Van Du, antiretroviral support programs, street nurse programs, the Naomi heroin trial, the Salome hydromorphone trial, and many other leading edge projects. 
But perhaps the most famous of all is InSight, North America's first supervised injection site. Opening in 2003 and saved from our very own federal government by the Supreme Court in 2011, InSight has attracted international attention and has paved the way for new sites across Canada. But it is pretty safe to say that all of these innovations that I've talked about, including InSight, were led directly by the community and supported by NGOs. In the case of the downtown east side, a lot of the credit should go to Van Du, the Vancouver area network of drug users. and the Portland Hotel Society. Again, it should be noted that the evidence came later. The opening of InSight only came after the establishment of unsanctioned sites and the determination of community members to break existing laws. While efforts to enhance HIV prevention, testing, and access to care and treatment must certainly continue and be improved for people who use drugs, the overdose crisis has now become the dominant issue. Over 10,000 people have died from an unintentional drug overdose in the past three years in Canada. There have been 4,000 of these deaths in British Columbia alone. All the available harm reduction programs have been no match for a street drug supply that has become unpredictable, unstable, and toxic. The only reasonable response is to offer people a safer drug supply. It is always... <laughs> it has always made sense to offer people a legal, regulated option to receive drugs. Expecting people to buy drugs from an illegal, unregulated market that is run by organized criminal gangs never made much sense. However, the situation has changed dramatically in the past few years with the disappearance of heroin and the increasing restrictions on opioid prescriptions. Prohibition created an extremely dangerous situation for people who are purchasing these drugs from the street. My own thoughts on a legal regulated supply of opiates have gone from, this is probably a good idea, to this is absolutely necessary, to this is a moral imperative. Admittedly, not everyone has joined me on this journey, but I think that the idea is generally gaining momentum. Two years ago, no one was really talking about a safe supply of opioids. Now a lot of people are, including governments. I was speaking at a community forum on safer drug supply in Ottawa just last week. As a member on a panel, I was asked, who is deciding that drug users should die? I was initially stumped. I hadn't really thought about the overdose crisis in those terms. What if 10,000 Canadians accidentally died of something else? Wouldn't there be some sort of inquiry? Wouldn't this dominate the news and be at the top of the political agenda? And wouldn't we be trying new things? Who is deciding that drug users should die? It is actually not that different of a question than we asked around who should die in Africa. We had the drugs that could save people's lives, but it was just a little too much trouble to get them out. Where's the logic? For over three years, we have known that every exposure to street drugs carries a risk of overdose and death. We actually have drugs that people would use instead of street drugs. But somehow we have decided that it is too much trouble and there may be unintended consequences. To me, it is hard to imagine any unintended consequences that could make the overdose crisis worse than it is now. A scale up of the safer supply of opiates to levels that would be needed to reduce overdose deaths across the country will require low barrier programs that do not require observation of every dose. It will also be necessary to offer inexpensive opiate pills that can be crushed and injected. In Vancouver, we are working on a project that would dispense hydromorphone pills through a biometric dispensing machine. This is fully programmable and very secure. It can track the dispensing of each dose in real time. It will give people some autonomy over when and how they acquire their drugs, 
and can still provide rapid access to services when, re when requested. Not only would a safe supply essentially eliminate the risk of overdose, it would provide much needed relief from the constant pressure to acquire drugs and reduce the criminal activities that are driven by the illegal drug market. Many of the challenges that we face in HIV can be captured by the concept of structural violence. Well, the term was introduced by Johann Gultang in 1969, a very useful definition was provided by Paul Farmer. Structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individual populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organizations of our social world. They are violent because they cause injury to people. My own career in public health has really been focused on identifying factors that are associated with HIV infection and other serious illnesses. These factors are commonly called social determinants of health. There are books and entire journals about social determinants of health. Much of the epidemiology presented at this meeting will be about social determinants of health. We will discuss childhood trauma, residential schools, sexual violence, youth in care, mental illness, criminalization, incarceration, homelessness, stigma, and a whole range of things that are associated with the risk of HIV infection. These, of course, are all critically important and we need to talk about them. However, in recent years, I have found the term social determinants of health does not really capture what is happening. It is just too passive. It is as if these social determinants of health are random, of, random events or just things that sort of happen to the unfortunate. It seems difficult to turn these associations into action. Structural violence is much more actionable. It recognizes that these structures are constructed by society and therefore could be changed. They are not some random event whether it was the residential school system, the welfare system, or drug prohibition. These environments have been created by us. Our job really should be to identify this structural violence and advocate for change. These are pictures of structural violence, environments that we have made and are perpetuated through our laws and policies. The plight of drug users living in tents, food insecure, surrounded by violence, in and out of prison for drug use, and now the constant threat of overdose, are all structural violence. They are not simply determinants of health. If you actually ask people who are at risk of overdose and HIV and other bad outcomes what they really want, it is not more medical care or harm reduction. It is knocking down the structural violence that is their world. This is a poster from last year's Day of Action on the overdose crisis. Notice that there is nothing about more addiction treatment, more harm reduction, or more recovery homes. People want an end to oppression, criminalization, and poverty. And not until we fix some of these structural barriers can we provide the necessary care and treatment. I will finish up with a few thoughts around advocacy. I've tried to illustrate through these historical examples that change in progress was largely driven by advocacy and activism that many of the innovations and progress that we have made in HIV came through doing the right thing. The support of research, while important, came later. In fact, research findings on their own may not move the dial that much. In areas where minority rights are involved and where ideology and political expediency rule the day. This is where advocacy is critical. So what does advocacy look like? Who should be doing the heavy lifting? And what are the steps of engagement? Well, I've created a ladder so that you can decide where you currently stand. <laughs>
All the steps are important and you can technically move up and down as required. The progression from researcher, medical expert, to translational research, to advocate, to activist, and finally to shit disturber. Like with all ladders, the higher you go, the riskier it becomes. But like all climbs, the higher you go, the greater the rewards. You might ask, does climbing this ladder impact on our credibility as scientists? It might. If you go too high, you may no longer be viewed as an impartial and dispassionate researcher. You may never actually be able to back down. But as you learn more, it becomes harder to remain an impartial and dispassionate researcher. I have had some personal experience with this as I have been trying to find my own footing. This is a picture of some direct action against the federal government's cuts to refugee health care that would have had an impact on access to HIV treatment. Direct physician activism won out in this case and the damaging policies were reversed. During these actions, I even had Jason Kenney, who was the immigration minister at the time, refer to me as an anarchist. You'll notice that the highest rung on my ladder was shit disturber. Presumably anarchists would require a higher ladder. <laughs> Donning a black hoodie at a protest is probably getting nearer the top of the ladder. This may not be necessary for everyone, but at the very least, communities who are fighting for their rights, and in many cases their lives, deserve our, our support. I am always surprised that so few people from the medical and research community participate in protests. They're great fun and they're really important. At this stage of the HIV epidemic, 35 years and counting, we should realize our efforts will be limited without real change to the social drivers of the epidemic. We need to recognize that structural violence, the things we do to people and the environments we create need to change. So does HIV cause AIDS? I'll let you decide. Thank you.